of that particular report. That story is the basis of our discussion tonight, talking about AstraZeneca and the safety of that particular vaccine. Joining us tonight is Dr. Songok from the School of Medicine here in Kenyatta University, Department of Medical Microbiology. Many thanks indeed, Dr. Songok, for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for the invitation. All right. Now, looking into AstraZeneca vaccine, we have had um, Kenyans being um, pessimists. There have been jitters here and there. How safe is the AstraZeneca vaccine that the Ministry of Health selected for inoculation here in the country? So, um, a little bit about the background of the AstraZeneca vaccine. So, when the vaccine was rolled out, there was some resistance to begin with. So, some people were skeptical about it. They say that, you know, because they're using a new technology, it's n unlike the other technologies where the uh, virus was actually grown in cells and then attenuated that way. This one is where they're using the DNA technology. So what they took is they took the adenovirus, a uh, weakened virus from chimpanzees, and then they put the spike protein, the genome that caused for the spike protein, and then injected it into people. So people are skeptical about it to begin with. So going back to the issue of safety is that um, studies have shown that, you know, there were some concerns for sure, like, you know, patients who got the vaccine, some of them developed uh, blood clots in the, like in the mostly brain mm -hmm. blood clots. Mm -hmm. And these blood clots, when they looked at it keenly, like, you know, what has just been reported uh, is that um, it was about 20 people out yeah. of 20 million who were vaccinated. So when you look at it, the ratio is very small, yeah. like one to a million. So yeah. in terms of safety, it seems to be um, quite safe mm -hmm. to get the vaccine. All right, now let's look into the scenario that was recently witnessed uh, concerning Meru Governor, uh, Dr. Kranita Murungi. Yeah. Now, the concern was that um, he got COVID-19 um, days after he was uh, vaccinated. And therefore, the question was when and how does the vaccine now start working to produce the antibodies? Because some raised concern saying um, one can be vaccinated and, you know, within days a week, you, you, you contract COVID-19. How is the correlation concerning these two particular cases? Yeah, that is... Um a good question that um, raises concerns in many people. And, you know, in whenever there's a pandemic, people need that, you know, you get a vaccine today, mm -hmm. tomorrow you are good to go. Yeah. This is not the case uh, with these kind of vaccines. You know, vaccines take time. Yeah, sure. It's like planting a crop and then you let it grow and then let it germinate until you harvest. So mm -hmm. it's a process. So mm -hmm. it was, you know, 10 days after he got the vaccine, you know, he developed, uh, he still contracted the virus. So uh, three scenarios here. Mm -hmm. He could have been infected right before he got the vaccine and he was still in the incubation period where the virus was taking time right. to develop. Mm -hmm. The second scenario is that he might have been infected right after he got vaccinated. So, you know, that by then he had not developed enough antibodies. And then uh, the, third the third possibility mm -hmm. is that, um, you know, the vaccine is uh, 63 to 70% effective. Oh, okay. So there's uh, that possibility that he falls on the, you know, 30 to, you know, 40% uh, of those people who are not uh, protected. So mm -hmm. in that case, definitely, uh, you know, when the virus comes in, then somebody is going to get sick that way. So that's why they need the two doses. The first dose is given. You wait for um, eight weeks, actually mm -hmm. 12 to eight weeks, and then you get the second dose. So they say it takes about, studies have shown that it takes about 90 days, actually, to develop enough antibodies to protect somebody against the virus. So after the first shot, mm -hmm. it takes about four weeks, mm -hmm. I'd say three to four weeks, and right. then the enough antibodies um, are produced, mm -hmm. white blood cells, mm -hmm. to counter the virus. And then after that, after the second dose, is now after 90 days is when somebody can say, you know, I'm fully immune All right. to the no, virus. St still on that, does that now mean that when you um, contract COVID-19 and you already get, um, you had already been given the first jab, mm -hmm. does it now um, cancel the first jab or uh, do we assume now that the body uh, will assume that you had COVID-19? Does it in any way affect um, the first vaccination that you had taken, the vaccine you had taken, sorry? No, I don't think so, because mm -hmm. actually studies have shown that if somebody got um, infected the first time, definitely you got uh, the antibodies circulating already in mm -hmm. the body. So mm -hmm. uh, the chances of you know getting reinfected again, unless it's a new variant, because mm -hmm. now we have the mutation. So with the mutation, now that throws a spin on the whole uh, on the whole um, you know fight against COVID. Mm -hmm. But you know if you got the first vaccine, but you have not developed enough antibodies, it's possible that somebody will get sick. But the, what the vaccine is doing is that it's 
limiting the severity of the symptoms. Mm -hmm. So instead of somebody getting really sick to an extent that they will go to the ICU, right. it really generates enough antibodies that you just kind of feel that mild sickness and then you're fine thereafter. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Now, the question, the concern, uh, Dr. Songoke, in the country is that we have not seen key leaders getting vaccinated. Sure. And then they are not getting vaccinated at a time when Kenyans are, are quite skeptical, uh, skeptical concerning the issue of AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, when I mention leaders, I'm saying, for example, President Uri Kenyatta, I've not seen him being on the forefront to get this vaccine, which has sort of affected the public and created some sort of mistrust. Do you think, you know, the leaders have sort of, you know, not shown goodwill for this AstraZeneca vaccine, even though it is not mandatory, it is a voluntary process? Sure. I mean, as the president said, this is a voluntary process. You know, if you want to be vaccinated, you can be vaccinated. If you don't, then, you know, it's not forced. Mm -hmm. And I think um, the public has a point in the sense that uh, the way the, uh, the message was passed to the public was not that, uh, uh, you know, they didn't, th I'll say that the healthcare profession just didn't take enough time to teach the public about the importance and the uh, safety of these vaccines. Mm -hmm. So as you mentioned, you know, we've not seen the president, we've not seen the uh, vice president, we have not seen the prime minister go up to get the jobs. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, they gave some reasons that, um, you know, the frontline workers need to get vaccinated fast and mm -hmm. they don't fall in that fast group. So maybe when they, you know, after all the frontline workers are vaccinated, maybe they'll come in. And, you know, but uh, what I like to caution the public is that it's your health, it's, it's just upon you, you mm -hmm. know, you are not, you are not protected by virtue of the president getting vaccinated. When you get sick, it's just one person who is, you know, it's you who is feeling the pain. You know, it's the shoe wearer who knows where the yeah. shoe pinches. Mm -hmm. So in this case, I'll say that if the vaccines come, you know, we've seen that, you know, the, uh, the benefits outweighs the, um, the side effects. So it's up to the public to really take, uh, or individuals to take charge of their health at this point. All right. But now, you see, at this point, uh, at this point of the pandemic, we are seeing some sort of rigidity when it comes to the vaccine and not because it is AstraZeneca vaccine, it is because it is a vaccination process. And this yeah. has been seen time and again concerning different vaccines, including the HPV vaccine. Sure. Now, uh, why are we seeing um, key religious institutions, some key leaders refusing to get the vaccine and Kenyans at large still refusing to get the vaccine, especially young people who now think that maybe they might be asymptomatic to this coronavirus. Why are people so underwent in, in refusing to get uh, the COVID-19 job? Yeah, I think they, there are many reasons for that. When you look at vaccination, it goes back to 1600s, okay, 1500. People are not accepting you know, vaccination. So it's not something new mm -hmm. that people are refusing to accept a vaccine. In fact, when smallpox vaccine came, people are like, why are you preventing something that came from God? <laughs> okay, so there is, uh, there, you know, they're, they're proponents of um, anti-vaccines. And, you know, sometimes they have uh, some valid points that they can bring on the table and it's mm -hmm. worth listening to them. Mm -hmm. But we've always had people who refuse to, uh, to, to accept a vaccination. But what, what I like to point out too is that um, when you look at what vaccines have done for humanity, they really transform people's life. Uh, if you look back in the uh, 1800s when we had the smallpox, which killed about 300 million people, when the vaccine came, it stopped it. Mm -hmm. You know, we had polio. You know, when you walk in the streets now, you don't see a lot of people who have uh, deformities because uh, of the vaccine. We got the BCG vaccine. It works, you know, to some extent. We got the flu vaccine. It works. So there are many reasons why people refuse. And one could be just religious leaders who don't have full information about it or they refuse because of a particular methodology that they used. For mm -hmm. instance, you know, they say these viruses were grown in um, embryonic tissues and we are, not going, we are not going to accept it, okay? So there are some, you know, component of that. The other reason is that, you know, um, herd immunity has been there. Yeah. Other people have been vaccinated and they don't see any effect within their kids, so they sure. think that because they didn't see anything, mm -hmm. then, you know, vaccines are not that important. And um, I mean, there are many, many, many reasons why people have, um, why they're just not vaccinating their, their little ones. And with the COVID vaccine, I think the other resistance is that people are used to vaccinating babies. Now you're an adult. Somebody tells you, hey, walk into a clinic, get vaccinated. So mm -hmm. there is that mentality that we need to um, get away from that even adults can be, can be vaccinated. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, we just need to say, you know, it's a pandemic, guys. Yeah. So uh, that's my take on it. All right. 
Now, um, during this period of COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we have seen different vaccines from AstraZeneca, of course. We have seen Moderna, Janssen and Janssen. Um, there was a uh, Sinopharm from China. Now, why did the government procure AstraZeneca, a vaccine that is now um, turning to be controversial, stopped in some of the European countries, but now you're seeing a review uh, of the uh, measures they had taken. Why did the Kenya result to AstraZeneca vaccine at a time when coincidentally or unfortunately or fortunately it is being faced with um, controversies? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I think the reason, I mean, I'll, my opinion is that um, some of the initial studies that were done with the AstraZeneca vaccine were done in Kilifi, Cambridge. So I think there's that good collaboration, like we share some data with them mm -hmm. and uh, we were able to form a rapport with them. And then when it came to procuring the, medi the vaccine, mm -hmm. we were on the, on the front line on their end. The other, the other reason could be that, you know, uh, this was the, you know, you know, UK was willing to give us this vaccine. So in a pandemic, you, we accept what we get mm -hmm. for that reason. And I think probably they offered a good price tag for it. So that's why Kenyan got the, uh, the vaccine. And also CAVI plays a role when it comes to vaccine distribution. The other important ro thing about um, uh, AstraZeneca vaccine as opposed to vice, uh, Pfizer is because of the storage. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't require very cold temperatures like the Pfizer, which requires a very high refrigeration, minus 80. This one is just at normal free temperature. Uh, it can be stored and distributed. So I think there were many factors that were looked into by the committee that decided on um, procuring this uh, vaccine. Mm -hmm. yep. Now let's look into the issue of the third wave of um, coronavirus here in the country. Um, some of the health experts have said that this is one of the most dangerous waves we, ha we have had in the country as compared to the second wave. And it comes at a time where the Ministry of Health is inoculating the public. Now, from where you sit, do you think um, the third wave is um, the most dangerous, quote unquote, uh, sort of a wave of this particular pandemic? Yeah, well, so when you look at um, viruses, as you, you know, there are DNA viruses, RNA viruses. Corona is an RNA viruses. Viruses uh, make uh, mistakes when they are replicating. So this third wave, as I mentioned, you know, it could have been driven by uh, two major factors. One, as uh, it was reported earlier, is that as a public, we've let down our guards when it comes to, you know, keeping social distance, washing our hands. You know, it's almost becoming too normal yeah. that people have just, you know, relaxed a little bit. The other factor is that the virus has changed, right? So we have new variants now. So uh, when it started, it was just the old uh, COVID-19. Now we have the uh, South Africa variant. We have the UK variant. Mm -hmm. We now have the Japanese. We have even one from Nigeria. Yeah. And also we have the... Um, you know, uh, New York variant. So yeah. there's quite a number. And here in Kenya, the problem is that it's like we are shooting in the dark because we really don't know which variant is here. The last sequencing that was done was done in January by uh, Cambrick Liffey. So right now, we're not we are not really sure. Is this the UK variant that is here? Is this the South Africa variant? And the UK variant has been shown to be... Um, you know, more virulent. I, it doesn't even respond very well to the AstraZeneca vaccine. I think they saw the efficacy rate is about 10%. So it's not very uh, good in terms of um, uh, vaccine response to that. Mm -hmm. But we don't know. So this third wave, as I mentioned, can be driven by those two factors, the social aspect that we have just relaxed, mm -hmm. and the virus has changed. So, mm -hmm. um, and this virus, you know, if we have the South African variant circulating, it is twice as transmittable. So instead of, you know, if one person had it, instead of infecting two people, now it's going to be four, and then four infects, you know, another, you know, twice that. So it's going to be, it spreads more faster mm -hmm. than the first uh, uh, virus. All right. Now, today the Ministry of Health is talking about having a positivity rate of 22.1% in the country. When we look into the second wave, um, some actually didn't even notice the impact of that particular wave. But now in the third wave, which now is beginning, which is the beginning of our third wave, mm -hmm. we are seeing it um, hit hard in terms of the yeah, number sure. of deaths that are being reported. Yeah. Now, are we foreseeing a situation whereby the third wave will be here for a long time? Do we see a situation whereby the Ministry of Health might have, you know, to put in um, stricter measures like, you know, closing 
um, the airports, our, our, our airwaves? Do, do, do you see the pr uh, that particular situation happening in the country, looking into the trajectory or um, the, the, the graph when it comes to the third wave? Sure. Uh, this, uh, the third wave seems to be more um, dangerous than the first two waves. Mm -hmm. And the reason could be that you know, the virus has changed. It's acquired uh, different mutations that makes it more uh, transmittable, more uh, virulent on the host. So uh, is the government going to have a lockdown? Are, are we going to go back to the initial you know, uh, you know, measures that they put in place? That is unclear. You know, are we going to close down the airports? It, we don't know at this point. I think that's up to the Ministry of Health to, uh, to make a call on that. But you know, I, from my own point of view, you know, if, the, if, the vir if, the, if the new mutation is here, it's already here. Mm, yes. So it's up to us to just you know deal with it. You know, uh, you know, closing down. I don't know how much of that is going to achieve. I think if mm -hmm. we get enough people vaccinated, yeah. and we have enough herd immunity, then uh, we may be able to make some headways that way. All right. Now talking about the the issue of herd immunity, um, uh, the government of course chose AstraZeneca vaccine, but you are seeing different countries. I'm not really um, decide to use one particular vaccine, like in South Africa. Although um, they are having a new variant, um, they had to stop AstraZeneca and have other vaccines due to um, the, the AstraZeneca vaccine not working for the new variant in, in South Africa. Now here in the country, uh, given that we're having, uh, we're not yet sure which variant we have in the country, why um, does the Ministry of Health not, you know, have other choose other vaccines to be uh, mixed up with the AstraZeneca so that we can have either Moderna, sure. Johnson and & Johnson as other countries like Australia and South Africa are doing? Yeah, I, I think that's a very, very good question. It's a very good suggestion. And I think until we know which variant is cycling in Kenya, all we, as I mentioned, we like we're shooting in the dark. We can't really face our target. Mm -hmm. And um, I think um, the best thing to do in this case is to sequence, you know, get more samples from the patients and do a sequence analysis and then from there make a call on which uh, vaccine are we actually going to use in this case. Mm -hmm. And then uh, put in the measures uh, that is required to procure these vaccines. For instance, as I mentioned, the Pfizer vaccines will require more storage facilities. So in terms of that, it may require that we do some, up, you know, it may require that they do some modification in terms of be able to uh, have the capacity to distribute and disseminate the, um, the vaccine mm -hmm. that way. All right. Now, there's a lot of rumors, or let's say, um, yeah, let me, let me call them rumors, going on the social media that yeah. the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation um, conspired to have, you know, the COVID-19 uh, be in the world so as to reduce the population. I know you're a doctor. You have had some of this conspiracy. Sure. They they come sure. with any 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 pandemic. <laughs> sure. uh, of course, as, as as the public tries to get answers mm -hmm. concerning some of this situation. Now, from where you sit, is this the case? Do you think it is? Because it is something that even journalists are trying to investigate whether sure. there is some truth therein. Yeah, uh, for every good cause, there is always um, a you know a, a blind you know investigation to it or uh, dark side to it. So when you look at the history of Bill and Melinda Gates, you know, they have done a lot for humanity in terms of pushing for vaccination, pushing for climate change. So the, I think history speaks for itself. And then when you go to the question of are they here to reduce the African population in terms of this vaccination? And, you know, uh, the reason why they bring the issue of fertility and the COVID vaccine is that they looked at the... Um, the protein, the S protein, the spike protein that shoots out on the uh, on the coronavirus, mm -hmm. it looks the same as the syncytin one protein that is found in the placenta. So there's a physician in uh, Germany called um, I think his name was Wolf Dong uh, Woodaf, something like that, mm -hmm. and he came up with this uh, uh, notion that you know if you give people antibodies, you know we g you know we gave these shots, then it's going to generate antibodies that's going to target. Uh, the syncytin one uh, protein, and this is going to have some issues when it comes to pregnancy. But when you look at these studies that were done during the clinical trials, is that they found out that even those women who got the vaccine mm -hmm. were able to um, conceive and they are now pregnant. So it doesn't really have any uh, effect when it comes to fati fertility, not mm -hmm. that we know of. So the propaganda about Bill and Melinda Gates, I think the science debunks that and um, it holds no ground. Mm -hmm. 
Now let's look into the trial stage when it comes to um, AstraZeneca vaccines, uh, vaccine when they're doing um, the trial. Now um, sources have emerged that when they were doing the trial, the old people um, were sort of, the population of the old people was not quite um, large um, to give a clear sure. uh, picture when it comes sure. to whether um, the old people are uh, safe, they're, they're out of danger when it comes to that, that particular vaccine. And here in Kenya, um, the CAS for Health, Dr. Matthew Mogange, recently announced that the old people will be, give, will be given the priority, given the number of deaths and uh, the demography when it comes to that. Sure. Now, when the Ministry of Health is taking the um, decision to inoculate the old people, mm -hmm. are we really moving too fast, uh, looking into how the trials of this uh, vaccine was done? Sure. Um, I think when you look at the benefit of uh, vaccinating older people versus the severity of the disease when they get infected, it outweighs the, uh, the risk that comes with it. Because you've seen that most of the people who, um, you know, the larger population of those who are in ICU beds who have uh, died recently have been people above 50, those with underlying conditions. It's and that is a target group that needs to be to be vaccinated. In as much as they were not included a lot, like their number size, the sample size was small. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't seem to have. Um, you know, it is still safe for them to get their vaccination because this is the vulnerable population and should be targeted for that. I think the pregnant women who are not included and the children were not included in the study because it's difficult. You know, mm -hmm. for somebody to say, "Hey, here is my kid. Go use him for clinical trials," yeah. or "Here is my pregnant." You know. You know, I'm here, I can, you know, be here uh, for clinical trials. So those were not included in the clinical trials, but the old people, uh, there's not been a whole lot of complication related to them other than the blood flows that we mentioned at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Now, given that, you know, the children and the pregnant mothers are not included, does that mean that, you know, the, the government will not be taking a risk in terms of um, vaccinating them once we have the uh, priority groups being given um, the first uh, priority? Yeah, I think uh, uh, given uh, the group that was not uh, included in the clinical trials, I think it will be risky to take that um, trajectory of vaccinating people who are not included in the clinical trials because it's not really known how it's going to affect this uh, young population. Mm -hmm. So I think it's good to stick with the, um, with the you know, people above 18. And you know, we can get to that herd immunity where we get to almost, um, uh, you know, 60% of the country, mm -hmm. you know, vaccinated, then the children and the, the uh, pregnant mothers will be protected that way. All right. Now, since you, you've touched on the herd immunity, um, when are we expected to reach the herd immunity, looking into the different doses that the Ministry of Health has, mm -hmm. of course, expected to get into the country? You know, right now we're having 1.2 million doses. Mm -hmm. When are we expected to have this particular herd immunity that, of course, will um, sort of alleviate the country from danger? Yeah, everybody, everybody is looking forward to that. I mean, we really, we've been pushed to the to the brim by this uh, this pandemic. You know, everybody needs that relief. When are we going to get there? You know, it may not be next week. It may not be next month. It may take a while. It's going to take a while before we get that herd immunity. Okay. So as you mentioned, we've got 1.2 million vaccine uh, doses. Mm -hmm. So if two doses are required for that, you can see that this is enough to vaccinate about half a million people, we need to get up to 20, at least 30 million people so that we can say that we've really vaccinated uh, enough population. And when you look at the Kenya population, excluding children, it really requires almost the entire adult population to be vaccinated so okay. that we can hit that herd immunity. So, and with the new variants coming in, that just throws in a new trajectory to the problem. It just complicates the matter further. Yeah. And uh, when are we going to see light at the end of the tunnel? I mean, it will happen at some point, but you know, when it's just n still not clear, but you know, let's just keep doing what the Ministry of Health has put forth as we uh, get the jobs. All right, now, uh, because of time, uh, Dr. Songok, uh, can you give us your parting shot looking into um, the positive and the negative when it comes to the inoculation process where the Ministry of Health has missed it, where the public has missed it, and also our leaders who are our, uh, our key influences, so, so to speak. Yeah, I think I'll first of all like to congratulate the government of Kenya for what it has done in terms of uh, containing the virus. I mean, as a country, we've really done a good job in terms of uh, putting strict measures out there to help the public. 
And it's up to the public to really take those measures to heart and, um, and uh, carry them out. Mm -hmm. So um, in terms of vaccination, I'll say that uh, the vaccines have been provided. And this is a safe gateway for us to be able to reach that heart immunity mm -hmm. and to be able to uh, pull out our mask and finally say, hey, we are free. So uh, the, I, I'll say that, I mean, no one is safe until um, we, most of us get the vaccine. So let's not rely on somebody else getting vaccine wait and see, and we're waiting for somebody else to be vaccinated so that we can see, but let's just get out there and do what we can to protect ourselves and to protect um, the future in terms of um, getting infected. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Songok, for making time and giving us your um, perspective concerning the AstraZeneca vaccine safety and also the third wave of coronavirus pandemic that is here in the